All right, we are now recording. Okay, um, so as Satika said, going through the timeline, uh, we did a round of community engagement, listened to folks, did a lot of data collection. So that's what I'm gonna talk about first is what we learned from round one, uh, both from what we heard from the community and what we found out from our data analysis. And I'm gonna go very quickly, it's a lot of information, if um, I'm gonna to touch on each point very quickly. And if you want to learn more, there's a wealth of information on the city plan website and we'll make sure that you get those resources afterward if you wanna do a deeper dive. So first, what we heard from the community. Um, we heard a lot of these things that uh, are on this slide right here are, are things that we heard everywhere in the city, um, in all five areas of the city. So people want to see local ecosystems pre preserved, restored, um, and have access to those ecosystems, especially access to water, public access, free access to green space and water. Um, people wanna see more collaboration and coordination among the various jurisdictions that share this space that we're planning for. Um, the urban growth boundary, people want to see that uh, be protected and better, the, and the edges better managed. Um, a, a, a lot of what we heard was about the importance of the city's Gullah Geechee culture and history specifically, um, and doing more to protect, preserve, and celebrate that culture and history. Um, more affordable commercial space to support more local small businesses, more housing types um, that can meet all income levels, life stages, household sizes, um, housing work close to where people work, increasing connectivity across the city um, for people, not just in cars, but for people walking, biking, um, better transit options, and um, ultimately to continue to be engaged beyond this plan uh, and having better communication and transparency from the city, not just the planning department, but all departments. And here are some things that we heard specifically from West Ashley community members. Um, so it's an area that is loved um, for its suburban, community-oriented suburban neighborhoods. So a lot of tight-knit communities. Uh, there's an assortment of parks and recreation, wealth of amenities. Um, and, and people really love this, the diversity of, of the communities in West Ashley. And there's a, a level of affordability in West Ashley that, that's different from other places in the city. Um, even though, West Ashley has everything, it's hard for people to get from one place to the other, um, with the exception of a, a handful of very walkable neighborhoods like Avondale and Burns Downs. Um, so uh, what people wanting to see more sidewalks, safe crosswalks, um, more connectivity for the folks who live in West Ashley to be able to reach all of these great amenities that exist nearby, um, and also concern about the noise from the increase in traffic. Um, so, uh, folks recognize the potential in old shopping centers for redevelopment and also would like to see the future of West Ashley provide a mixture of housing. So this is something that um, was mentioned citywide but was especially prevalent what we heard from uh, West Ashley community members and having a, a variety of, of transportation options. And, um, and then finally, uh, some sp specific requests for our parks and recreation staff in regards to uh, a public pool and free access to the shoreline. So again, that free access to water was important in West Ashley especially. So we did a deep dive into two issues specifically, housing and flooding. And uh, these are two of our city's greatest challenges. We know this and so we took this opportunity to uh, learn more about those challenges by uh, we worked, we contracted with consultants, two different teams of consultants to help us understand these challenges better. I'm gonna hit a, a few quick highlights for each of these um, research efforts and what we learned. So first I want to start with what we mean by affordable housing when we use this term in the context of our housing analysis for the city plan. We are using the definition that is um, issued by the Federal Department of Urban and Housing Develop Housing and Urban Development, which says that housing is affordable to someone if the housing costs do not add up to more than 30% of what that household earns annually. 
and that's before taxes. And um, depending on how much someone makes, uh, that affordability will vary. And uh, they categorize different affordability levels based on percentage of, of, of the percentage that that household makes of the area median income. For example, 30% uh, of the area median income or AMI for a single household is 17, about 17,000 annually. So when HUD says housing that's affordable to someone making 30% of the AMI, that means that that housing must be priced um, at a point that is no more than 30% of that person's income. Um, when we use the term affordable housing uh, in the context of the city plan housing analysis, we mean all, all housing that is subsidized um, to meet the income needs of varying income ranges. So we're not just referring to workforce housing, if you've heard of that term, we're not just referring to low income housing, we're referring to the full income range spectrum from um, you know, earning nothing annually to earning um, 68,000 a year annually for a single household. Um, we, this is not news to anyone, but we have, um, we have a, some additional numbers to shed light on this uh, problem of affordability and the cost of living in Charleston. So we know that 42% of Charleston households are spending more than that 30% on housing costs. And that's just rental and mortgage um, costs specifically. It's not including utilities or insurance. So if we were to factor those in, this percentage point would likely go much higher. Um, and we know that this is disproportionate um, across race, at least in terms of black and white neighborhoods. And so majority black neighborhoods are experiencing this at a greater degree or twice as likely as um, uh, neighborhoods with a majority of white residents to be cost burdened. Um, and if you look at the cost burden percentages across the areas of the city, West Ashley is about 46%, so a little bit, a little bit higher than the average of the rest of the city, but not as high as some of, uh, not as high as Johns Island. We also understand that it's not just housing costs um, that lead people to choose where they live, um, that it could be how close it is to work, um, th their age, their family size. Um, and, and so we also looked at affordability in terms of when you add up not just the housing cost, but the cost it takes for you to get back and forth from that house to your job or to the other places you frequent. So we looked at the transportation costs as well. Um, and these, these can really add up. And West Ashley, when you factor in both housing and transportation, it's actually one of the it's actually the most affordable area of the city to, um, to live, just based on average housing and transportation costs for the average household in West Ashley. And then finally, we looked at what our need for more affordable housing is in the next 10 years, based on current need and projected need from uh, expected population growth over the next 10 years. Um, and You'll notice a high number for uh, West Ashley, which is over 6,000 units that we would need to be um, affordable in order to meet the income needs of our residents, our current residents and future residents uh, by, by 2030. That's a reflection as well of West Ashley being the most populous area of the city. Um, so that's, that's uh, one piece of why that number is so high. But the, I think the main takeaway is we really need uh, more affordable units everywhere. Um, not just in West Ashley. We also learned that our greatest need for more affordable housing is for the income range of people making 30% of the area median income and below. So we would need more than 7,000 units for that income range alone to be able to meet the needs of everyone in our city. Okay. Um, uh, again, the second thing that we did a deeper dive into was understanding our challenges with flooding and how we can plan accordingly. So the plan, this city plan, will address primarily development and land use decisions over the next 10 years. Um, and it will also, it will also guide uh, investment for future drainage and transportation networks. The piece that we were missing 
to inform all of this was a, a citywide understanding of our soil, water, and ecology, um, and how those will change with sea level rise and climate change, um, and how those uh, should, should influence and inform development and land use today. So the key thing that we got out, we got a lot, we got almost 300 pages of uh, report and analysis from this work that you can read if you really want to take the time. But I'm going to highlight just this one piece, which is the elevation risk zones. And this is this map is what we have used to inform our land use recommendations, which we'll cover later in the meeting. So the city's been broken down into four categories, high ground, adapt zone, compound flood risk zone, and tidal flood risk zone. The high ground is what it sounds like. That's um, where there's the least risk for flooding and storm, um, and, but also the greatest responsibility to uh, keep for your neighbors downstream from flooding. Uh, the adapt zone is where there's less risk of flooding, but uh, where uh, it's not impossible. And so there's st we still need to be looking at how we develop in a, in a, in a safe way, in a way that can be adapted um, to the changing, uh, to our changing landscape going forward. The compound flood risk zone is where there's a, a variety of, of influences um, and where flooding is frequent. And um, the tidal flood risk zone is where it floods today in sun, sunny weather because of the high tides. And this will only continue uh, to get worse in time. And um, likely what we've seen a lot of places, the marsh will actually move inland and so uh, this is a very dynamic area and it's the highest risk um, we need to be considering going forward. This is a zoomed in version of that map, just looking at West Ashley specifically. So you'll see the, high, um, the highest area in West Ashley is along Sam Rittenberg Boulevard, uh, Paul Cantrell Boulevard um, between 526 and Sam Rittenberg in that area. Um, uh, a little portion in the Ardmore Sherwood area. And, and then uh, the vast majority of the high ground beyond uh, that is outside of the urban growth boundary. So that's um, protected as, as uh, being slated for primarily rural uh, development. And Christopher can say more about um, uh, what's happening along the urban growth boundary in West Ashley. If folks have questions about that, we can address that later. And then finally, these are planning strategies that they recommended that we look at, we adopt uh, in e everywhere in the city. So in all uh, high ground, low ground, ad adapt zone, um, no matter what the land use category is, these are planning strategies that need to be um, used in combination with each other. And they'll depend, which combination we use will depend largely on the very uh, conditions specific to a particular site. Um, so adapt, and defend are two that we might use um, if an area, if, if, an L, if a structure can be raised, that's a, an example of adaption. Um, if it can't, if something can't be raised, um, uh, then maybe we look into defense like a berm or seawalls. Um, reserve is where we uh, try and restore an ecosystem or preserve an ecosystem. And then grow is where we, we can, we've learned that we can accommodate growth in some places in the city as long as we do so responsibly. And then the last piece uh, before I wrap up is that um, we heard from uh, our first round of engagement and a desire to protect specifically Golokichi communities uh, across the city. Um, also uh, many communities known, you may have heard the term African-American settlement communities. And um, we learned that these had not, uh, most had not been formally acknowledged on a map uh, previously. And so we have been working with residents of settlement communities across the city to rectify that and um, make sure that these communities are acknowledged going forward. And also have some draft recommendations about how we can better support um, the, vi the vision that these communities have for the future of their area going forward, uh, whether it's preservation or, or growth. Um, and so uh, if you've not familiar with this term, these are communities that were settled by free Gullahichi people in the Reconstruction era. Uh, they vary, uh, they're all unique. No community is alike, um, uh, but the sort of similarity across the communities is that each community has a shared history. Um, each community has a shared identity. 
there's a strong connection to the land and they share cultural institutions or have shared uh, like schools, churches and businesses. Um, so uh, again, we're, uh, the, the point of the purpose, the goal is to uh, include a map of these in the plan, uh, include them in uh, land use recommendations going forward being considered um, and to include recommendations about supporting their preservation goals going forward. And here is, here's the working map, I emphasize working. Uh, this is still in progress. Um, some of these have been confirmed, some of them have not. We're still meeting with, still meeting new folks every day um, and learning more about these communities um, and what makes them special. Um, and so uh, I hope um, if there are folks on the call who are interested in this, that we can connect after this meeting and learn more from you. Uh, included, if you're calling on the phone and you can't see, included on this map are Red Top, Sanders Road area, uh, Melvin, Washington Park, um, uh, I want to say Heritage Park, Maryville, Ashleyville, and then various communities um, around the Citadel Mall, uh, Savage Road area, Grant, um, Ingram Hill, Orleans Woods, Trotty Woods, um, Grant Hill, Jenkins Woods, um, so there's several there, and this, this map is showing both the existing communities and also the historic areas that um, have changed over time. How did I do, Satika? Hmm. Did very well, very well. Did I make it within 15 minutes? Uh, you did. Actually, yeah, you did. <laughs> I think you made it one or two minutes less. Yes, you did. So we'll just pause and... Um, see if anybody has any specific questions for Chloe based on what she covered. I know it was a lot, but is there any questions that anybody has? Mika, this is Donna. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add to the, the, there is a definition for settlement communities, but we're also just very interested in the even modern African-American communities. For example, Heritage Park was a modern built subdivision for African-Americans. Washington Park was a modern built. So we're not, even though that's the definition that we're working under, we're still working under even um, a modern definition of those. So please, if you have any information, add to the discussion. We would greatly appreciate that. Gotcha. All right, no questions at all. Let's see, let's check in the chat. Um, let's see. All right, we don't have any specific questions, um, but there are some links in the chat uh, specifically. So if, it, and, and this was a condensed version, um, so you can definitely hear more, read more about it, excuse me, within the blog. So all those links have been placed um, in the chat for you so that you can click on them and. I would suggest if you, um, unless you want to go look it on your own, if you want to click any of those now, just so you can have them open to refer back to on your computer, that would be great. Um, and then uh, there's also the city plan water analysis report and the housing analysis report is also in that. So you can access any of those in there. All right, we'll keep moving. All right. And who's, who's doing this one tonight, Chloe? This is our very own Christopher Morgan. Christopher Morgan, come on down. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. <clears throat> so what is a future land use map? So this is a, a, a visual guide that we have to show what this plan will be recommending for land use and development. It incorporates things we've heard from the community. It helps our planning commission and staff and city council make decisions now and into the future. And it's a general guide. So for instance, some of you may have heard things about you know, elevation-based zoning and, and things like that. Well, this plan is not zoning. It makes recommendations that could lead to new zoning, but these are what we might refer to as elevation-based land use recommendations. Um, next slide. So we have our water analysis implications that are part of the land use. And of course, these are such things as reserving higher intensity land use categories for the high ground zones, assigning lowest impact land use categories for the, the conservation and parks uh, to the tidal flood risk zone. And between these, 
we can have our mid to low intensity land use categories, but there's gonna have to be very site specific planning and mitigation strategies based on the drainage basin you're in, based on the types of soils you have in your site, based on, it could even come down to if a particular site has access to drainage easements heading away from it to in further into the drainage basin. So there are a lot of things that factor into how intensely a site can be developed. Um, let's go to the next slide. So these are our different categories, starting from rural, which is actually areas outside the urban growth boundary, and then suburban edge, which is typically just on the inside of the urban growth boundary, then suburban, which is a good bit of the city and a lot of our neighborhoods, particularly in West Ashley, and then what we call our neighborhood, which is a little bit more oriented to some downtown neighborhoods that are a little bit denser, but there are some areas in West Ashley that fit this category. And then neighborhood edge, which is those types of uses that are needed in every neighborhood, but you don't necessarily want them smack dab in the middle. They need to have traffic access to them. They need to be kind of on the edge of the neighborhood, so they're in close proximity, but they aren't, you know, an impact to the livability of the neighborhood. And then we go on to our city center category that is based on, you know, the areas of the city that should have the most intense uses that serve a greater um, area of that part of the city. Next slide. And then we have some of our special land use categories such as campus for our high school campuses or our assisted living facilities or our hospital campuses, our job center. Some of you might remember the doo plan that the city worked on. That area has a lot of jobs in within it. Um, we also have areas um, uh, further out in West Ashley that we'd love to incorporate or encourage job growth in the office sectors. Then we have some industrial areas. West Ashley doesn't have as many of these. The landfill is one of those. There are a few other areas in West Ashley, but it's more limited in West Ashley. And then of course our low impact and conserved areas, which is um, low elevation lands in particular, tidal flood risk areas and future marsh migration areas. And um, they may have some degree of limited development but in the future, structures are likely to be elevated so as not to impair natural intertidal systems. Uses are limited and residential densities are limited to less than one unit per acre. Lands are preserved via public ownership, not necessarily to the general population or private ownership with preservation or conservation easements also. Uh, then we have natural and wetland areas. Those are currently natural and wetland areas. And then we have parks that are publicly or privately owned lands open to the general population for recreation. Next slide. So some of the key changes we've made to the land use maps are making sure that areas for future growth are determined by elevation considerations, the high ground, and current and future transit infrastructure. Particularly like in the downtown area, we have uh, more intensity along the low country rapid transit line, which is a new bus system that's gonna help make downtown more accessible. I've uh, just talked a little bit about the neighborhood edge designation on the edge of neighborhoods. And then we've just talked about also the low impact and perceived, pres excuse me, preserved designation uh, is a new category that was part of the land and water analysis. And city center, we've talked a little bit about that. Uh, neighborhood designation, um, these were previously kind of urban neighborhoods. And like I said, most of these are in the downtown area. And then as Chloe's so well explained, we have our African-American settlement communities identified as well. Although they could be a range of different intensities based on what is on the land at present and how high the land is. Next slide. And then some of the key changes in West Ashley. Um, West Ashley had a lot of areas that in our previous plan were designated as highway. And we felt like that just wasn't really giving justice to the unique character of West Ashley. And that's why we switched a lot of these to the neighborhood edge uh, to maybe be a little bit less auto intensive the way the highway was. Um, we do have the exception of the auto mile on Savannah Highway, which actually, believe it or not, is a fairly intense job center in West Ashley. Thousands, several thousand people have very good jobs in that area. And that is one of the greater concentrations of employment in all of West Ashley. So we're saying that, you know, that is an area that, that functions almost more as a job center for West Ashley than it does 
as some sort of highway designation. Um, and then um, because most of the high elevation in West Ashley occurs along Sam Rittenberg um, and Plan West Ashley has also identified this as a key redevelopment area, we did create areas along Sam Rittenberg and St. Andrews that moved to city center and then also to neighborhood edge uh, because of that high elevation and because of things we've seen in previous plans like Plan West Ashley. And Long Savannah was changed to all suburban as the densities um, uh, exhibit that in that already approved PUD for that property. Next slide. So this is kind of the inner West Ashley. You also see some of downtown, but you see a lot of the suburban in the kind of um, uh, uh, um, light brown color there. Um, not really much suburban edge except way to the south of the West Ashley Greenway or out in the uh, old Charlestown district in the areas that are already existing with lower densities. Uh, and then you see some of the suburban, I mean the neighborhood edge and also some of the um, city center um, in the darker reddish brownish color. Um, you do also see the, the Savannah Highway. Um, can you all see my cursor? Is that cursor visible to anybody? No, probably not. Okay. Um, so I can't really point things on this, but um, uh, there are the, the job centers as we just talked about, and then um, the um, areas in the doo-wop area that are job centers as well. Let's uh, move a little bit further out and we can certainly bring these back up. Uh, next slide. This shows outer West Ashley. Again, you see here Citadel Mall, which is part of the city center. And that's based on the, the approved PUD for that property. Um, and then we have some uh, neighborhood edge around West Ashley Circle in the areas that are able to be developed out there. There's a lot of um, low impact and conserved areas around West Ashley Circle, but to the west and southwest, you do have some uh, neighborhood edge that could be greater intensities uh, further out, you see the dark blue of the industrial of the landfill, which is, you know, going to be there for a number of years more. Um, and then uh, beyond that, you have Long Savannah, which is in the suburban category, which we've talked about already. And um, suburban edge, which is really what the densities are like in our um, uh, Grand Oaks and Shadow Moss areas. Um, and um, a lot of parks here, particularly the very large park that's on the outer edge of the urban growth boundary around Long Savannah, the largest park in Charleston County. It's owned by Charleston County PRC. It does have some wetlands in it, but it also has some high land and it's gonna be a great permanent edge to that area of the urban growth boundary. Um, so those are some of the key high points in the maps and we're happy to um, go into those in more detail. If you all have questions, we're gonna look at them in more detail. Next slide. And then this is just our overall citywide parks and conserved lands. And it gives you a good sense of, you know, areas that will never be developed and that are publicly owned or have easements on them so that they can't be developed. Um, goes all the way to the Francis Marion Forest and the Canehoy area, to the preserved areas of Morris Island, and then some of the preserved areas like the Angel Oak on the edge of the urban growth boundary on Johns Island. I believe that's our last slide. There we go. Yeah, we've got a group discussion now. <laughs> Thank you, Christopher. Um, 